So I want to start out with a question. Have you ever talked yourself out of something? Anybody? Gary and I were looking at pickup trucks this morning online, and I don't know, I'm talking myself into and then out of buying a pickup truck, right? How about something that you go, oh, I should go and do this. And I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. You're talking about maybe calling somebody, talking to somebody, caring for somebody, stepping out in faith. Anybody ever talk themselves out of it? Besides me? We do it all the time, right? How about those moments when you've actually stepped out in faith and then something comes up in opposition to you? You encounter a struggle. And then you start talking yourself out of continuing what God has called you to do. Or is that just me again? Right? Um, when your back is up against the wall. And that's kind of what I want to talk about this morning in, in, in Nehemiah. Last week we started the series, or I started the series. And, I, and it, you guys need to know, I've preached this before. I've modified it a little bit for this context, but I've preached it before. And, and one of the things that I always told the churches that I ever served, I said, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. I don't ever want to preach at somebody. I need to preach what God has put on my heart. Because time and time and time again, when I've stepped out in faith, thinking that this is what God wants me to do, and then I face something of a little bit of opposition. And let me tell you that opposition isn't always external, is it? Sometimes we talk ourselves out of the very thing that God wants us so desperately to trust him in doing. And yet, in our lives, in our desire to be comfortable or a desire to get away from those difficult situations none of us likes to be uncomfortable none of us likes to be feeling like we're under attack and certainly we don't like it when we hear others telling us or internal voices we have those that good angel and that bad angel on our shoulder right you know the good angel tells oh you can do this and the bad angel saying you don't want to do this last week what I, what I started with was this verse. And this verse has been a powerful verse for me. And notice what it is. It's not, for I am God's masterpiece. What is it? We. It's a collective. And it's also a part of the decisions that you make and that you make and that I make. And they come together and they create this amazing masterpiece that God has created. We were created. We're God's masterpiece. Created anew in Christ Jesus. And we love that, right? We love the idea that, that and, and this is what brought us to Christ in the first place, this idea of being renewed. But Paul says it's so that we can do the good work that we were created for long ago was planned for us and the good things that he planned for us long ago these are good things that you and I have been tasked to do yes but also to be willing to step out in faith and to be willing to to do the things that we've been called to do and last week I also said the problem that most of us come up against is we go yeah but how and what I also wanted to remind us of is that we have all these lessons throughout the Bible God's word. If we look at one example, let's just take a look at the example. Jesus, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Remember, you guys know it well. A man is broken, he's been beaten, he's been left by the side of the road on the road to, to Jericho, from Jericho to Jerusalem. And on that road, robbers take and they beat him up, they leave him for dead. And there's three people that walk by. A priest, a Levite, a worker in the temple, and then the Samaritan. And we often want to get to the Good Samaritan, right? Because we all want to be like the Good Samaritan, right? But in reality, we also have to realize, more often than not, I am like the two guys who walked by. Oh, I'm busy. I don't have time. I don't want to get involved. In, oh, man, what is it going to cost me? And then we look at the Good Samaritan, and we see that it does cost he had to interrupt what he was doing. 
in order for him to serve. And yet, so often in my life, the yes, but how, but God, I know you're calling me to do this, but how? I'm just, I'm just me. I don't have what it takes. I don't have what you need from me. And last week we learned from Nehemiah that it's actually, there's a way in which we can learn from the person of Nehemiah that when he heard, when there was something that he saw there was a need, it broke his heart. And he sat down and cried. Now, I tend to be pretty emotional, easy crier. I get embarrassed, but I'm not ashamed of the tears. Not everybody cries. But there's something in our heart that should. We should cry in our hearts when we see an injustice, when we see something going on in this world, when we see something around us, maybe a neighbor, maybe a friend, maybe within our own family. It should break our hearts. But then Nehemiah, what he does immediately is to pray. He gets down on his knees and pray, God, what would you have of me? What would you have me do? And then when the call comes, when the answer comes, then to stand up and act at the prompting, when God gives the prompting. I don't know, did anybody get a chance? Don't raise your hand because this isn't school. But did you read Nehemiah or start Nehemiah? It's an awesome book. I would encourage you to do it. It's a first-person account of Nehemiah, a man who, who walked in that obedience. And like you and I, when he walked in obedience, he also faced opposition. And that's what we're going to talk about today. In Nehemiah, what we see is that he was called and he was gifted. He used the gifts that God had given him. He was a great organizer. He was a great leader. He was, he was a good encourager. But until he stepped out, guess what? He was not equipped. See, God doesn't call us to do something that is outside of our giftedness because God says, I want to gift you in order to do these things, but we're never going to experience the equipping until we step out into what it is that God has called us to do. And here's what I see in my own life. I know that I might be called, I might feel that call, that that internal, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, emotion, that I should do something about this. And, And then we realize, we can look at our lives and we go, well, I actually could do something, but oh man, it's just too much. It's going to cost me too much. Here's what you need to hear. God does not call and gift you to something that he's not also going to equip you to do. Think about that. Have you ever been overwhelmed by something? Nobody? Anybody ever been overwhelmed? Absolutely, right? We see things. We, we are in com- constantly bombarded by the needs of this world. And, and your, what you see and what you respond to is going to be different than me. That's part of that tapestry of that magnificent masterpiece. But there is a call. And then we go, well, yeah, I could do something. And then we always bring the but in there. But, oh, it's, I don't know if I could. Folks, that's the miracle point. That's when we step into those things that God is so anxious, willing, and able to equip us to do far more than we could imagine on our own. So last week we looked at Nehemiah. And I want to talk about that today. We're going to get into the weeds a little bit with Nehemiah. But Nehemiah's story should feel familiar to followers of Jesus. That any time God leads, any time God leads, and you step out in faith and do something generous, and you start to experience God equipping you, you guess what's going to happen? You're going to face opposition. And you're going to be tempted to quit. And unfortunately, I'll say in my life, often I have. I've given up on a relationship or I've, I've stepped out of that call because it was just getting to be too difficult or I've talked myself out of it in my own mind and in my own heart see it's not new with me and it's not new with you it's not new it's our human nature you can see it all throughout scripture all throughout history of faith of people called to do something but then they face opposition and now we're at a critical moment what do we do when we face opposition for those of you who don't know the story of Nehemiah real briefly 
In 586 B.C., the nation of Judah, the remaining Hebrew nation, called people of God, set apart people of God, or overrun by the Babylonian Empire, taken off into captivity. But just the good-looking, the, the useful, the young, everybody else, which I would probably be in that category, would be left behind. Useless. They took only the best of the best, and in that time, from 586 B.C. until Nehemiah's time, a couple of things happened. The Babylonian Empire under Nebuchadnezzar was overrun by a new empire called the Persian Empire. And this is King Cyrus. In the Babylonian way, it was to destroy culture. King Cyrus, with the new uh, Babel, or the Persian Empire, they were, he would take and, and say, I want your culture to be preserved. It was a way to be benevolent. And he allowed... Of 80 years later, 50,000 Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And this would have been with, uh, with Ezra, with the prophet Ezra. Now we get a few more years later, and we get to con the story of today. The temple was rebuilt in 515 under Ezra, but it was either constantly under attack or the pressure to surrender territory there were people that were still there in that land who were not happy at all that the temple was being rebuilt. And Nehemiah heard it. He was the cupbearer to the king. Very important position, but it was an invisible position. But he was right there in the king's court at all time. He was still a servant. He was still under this occupation that made him to be invisible. He comes before the king he hears about this, he prays about it, he comes before the king, and the king sees that something's wrong. He says, what's going on? I've never seen you sad in my presence before. And then Nehemiah stood up and acted, and he told the king about what was going on, the, that, the, the, that the walls were destroyed, that the temple was under attack. Now, I realize that's a little long to get to this point, but the king says, how can I help you? How can I help you? And then Nehemiah, immediately, because he's prayed specifically, Lord, soften the heart of the king, he comes to this. He says, if it please your majesty and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king agrees. But not only does he agree to send Nehemiah, he sends Nehemiah with an entourage, people to go with him to protect him, but he also gives him letters to all the governors of all these places in the Persian Empire, to say, let this man pass. And then he says, you know those cedars of Lebanon? I own those. This is the king who said this. And he says, and you can take whatever you need to rebuild the city gates. That was pretty powerful. God's at work in, in a non-believer, if you can imagine. The king agreed. I wish there was time to go through verse by verse. So Nehemiah went back. And under me and Nehemiah's gifted leadership, the faithful Hebrew people started rebuilding. And they start with the gates. They start with the gates. Now, why would they do that? It's because it was rubble everywhere. And it was to establish that this is where the roads go. This is where this purpose is. There were all sorts of neat names. Sheep gate, fish gate, old city gate, valley gate. My favorite, dung gate. You know why it was dung gate? Because that was where they gathered and threw out the dung. There was a purpose to it. And the purpose was to establish that this is a city. This is God's city. And we take care of the dung. And we take care of the sheep. And we take care of all these different things. And the people got to work rebuilding these gates, and they were excited, and they continued to do this. But immediately upon doing it, guess what? They faced opposition. There have been many times in my life where I've stepped out in faith, things are going great, and then suddenly someone says a word or a problem arises, and I go, ah, is this worth it? Let me ask you this. You ever reached out to somebody? And you go, oh, this is hard. Or you've decided maybe to, to give a little bit more of your hard-earned money as a gift to God. God, it's all yours, and I'll, maybe I'll start tithing, or maybe I'll give a little bit to a ministry, and then suddenly what happens? 
you get a bill in the mail. Not a dollar bill, but a bill. And you go, God, how am I going to do this? And the temptation at that moment in the facing of the opposition is to give up and to say, you know what, God, it's too hard. Here's what you need to hear. Bold acts of faith will always come with bold opposition. Think about that, folks. Bold acts of faith will always come with bold opposition. That's how our faith works. We have an enemy who does not want us to succeed in being this masterpiece. Nehemiah faced opposition. We're going to read a few of the verses. He, there was this guy by the name of Sanballat. I don't know if I'm saying it right. He was very angry when he learned that, he was, that we were rebuilding the wall. Again, remember, Nehemiah is doing this, writing this in first person. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? Do they think they can build a wall in a day if they offer enough sacrifices? Look at these charred stones they are pulling out of the rubbish and using again. Tobiah, and he, <laughs> do you remember that cartoon with the big dog and the little dog? Kind of the big dog's a tough dog, and the little dog's like, yeah, right, go get him, buddy. You know, I mean, here's Tobiah, who's an Ammonite, who probably was just like, oh, yeah, Sanballat, you're the big man on campus. He remarked, yeah, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked on top of it. They're mocking. They're, they're standing there mocking what's going on. Now, why is Nehemiah sharing this? Because he's saying it doesn't always take much to derail our plans. Even a word from somebody who, who teases or mocks, or we overhear gossip about what's going on. Sanballat and Tobiah were mocking and gossiping. And, and let me ask you, have you ever been dissuaded in what you wanted to do because somebody said something to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Even a well-meaning family member or friend or fellow Christian, you really want to do that? Do not, do not let the words of others dissuade you from doing what the Word of God is calling you to do. Don't let it happen. What did Nehemiah do? Did he go to Sanballat and Tobiah and say, hey, stop mocking us? No, what does he do? The first thing he did is he prayed. He prayed. And he said this, Hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. He just felt like God didn't know. God knew. But he said, May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sin, for they have provoked you to anger here in the presence of the builders. He prayed. A raw, emotional, angry prayer. But he prayed his heart to God. God, may they experience what we've experienced. And then the very next verse, at last the wall was completed to half its original height around the entire city for the people had worked very hard. Don't let the words of others guard your heart against the words of others, folks. I had a man in my church, a gentleman in my church, and he came to me very anguished one day. And he said, you know, I was at the coffee shop great place coffee shops lots of truth goes on there <laughs> right you can trust everything you hear at the coffee shop and this man that he was talking to this gentleman was talking to another guy and that guy says you know what your church a lot of nice people but it, it's just really nothing more than a service group it's it's no different than a rotary club or kiwanis or lions club and he, all you guys like to do there is drink coffee and get together and have fellowship, right? And he's really bothered by this. And I says, well, what did you do? He goes, well, I didn't do anything. I said, did you not say anything back to him? Did you not confront this? Did you not take that and say, no, this is very different? And then I asked him, and I said, do you believe it? And this is what broke my heart. He goes, well, I don't know. Maybe we're not any different. As a pastor, 
That broke my heart. And I think as a church, we need to be very careful that we don't fall into the trap of making this too casual. Because when God's people come together to do God's work, amazing things happen. But guess what? You're going to face opposition. I don't want this to be about us versus them, but sometimes it can feel that way, can't it? And the people in Nehemiah's story started to feel this way. They started to listen to the critics. When Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall were being repaired, they became, they, weren't, they stopped mocking. Now they're furious. They all made plans to fight against Jerusalem and to bring about confusion there. But we prayed. Again, first thing they do, they pray about it. They prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Then the people of Judah began to complain that the workers were becoming tired that there was so much rubble to be moved that we could never get it done by ourselves. Meanwhile, the enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The Jews who lived near the enemy came and told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us or attack you. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall and in the exposed areas, and I stationed people to stand guard with families, armed with swords, spears, and bows. Then as I looked at the situation, I called together the leaders and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. We have nothing to fear here. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your friends, your family, and your homes. And then there is, must be a gap when our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them. We all returned to our work on the wall. One of the gifts that Nehemiah had was to call it like it was. We are not going to be afraid. We give God glory for this, and we're going to get back to work on the wall. Sometimes the most well-meaning people can dissuade us from doing the most important work. But you need to understand, don't be surprised when you face opposition. Here's what Nehemiah teaches. Focus instead on being prepared. Any advancement of the kingdom of God, it attracts the attention of Satan himself. So don't be surprised, but also don't be unprepared. Here's what I want to tell you. If you don't want opposition, if you don't want opposition, I'll tell you what to do. It's easy. Just coast. Just coast in your faith. That'll keep the pressure off. Pursue a life which is the life which you think is an easy life. Pay more attention to Facebook and Instagram than to God's Word. And you know what? I know way too many Christians who do that. Look at their life. That's easy. Here's what I've found. Sometimes the people who present their lives as the easiest and the best and everything's going their way are the ones who are struggling the most in life. Don't listen to that. Focus on being prepared. Do what we all know we're supposed to do. Be in God's word. Be together with God's people. Prepare your heart because that opposition is going to come. But if you don't want opposition, don't engage your faith. Don't serve and don't you dare pray. (laughs) Don't give and certainly don't give sacrificially. Don't care about the things of God. Come to church but only for the fellowship and the coffee and only when it's convenient. And there's nothing better going on. But don't try too hard because the moment you do, the moment you step out of that comfort zone, the moment you step into God's call in your life, guess what? Something or someone is going to step in and try to stop you from doing it. If you don't want any opposition, stay out of the game. Keep living that comfort-driven life. But if you know God is calling you, don't be afraid. Be prepared. Step out in faith. Care for that which God has called you to care for. Let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. To step up and to step out requires us to step into God's care and protection. If you're feeling called to serve in some way, don't do it on your own. Step into God's care as you prepare. I don't know what God's challenged you to do in your heart. 
But can I tell you that when you do start to step out, you're going to face some opposition. Maybe it's your own mind talking to yourself, going, do I really want to do that? I, don't, you don't ever believe that you get to a point where it's over. I used to tell my church all the time, can you fog a mirror? And God is not done with you. Maybe what you used to do back when, you can't do now, but you can pray, you can support, you can encourage, you can use the gifts that God used you to step out and to do this, but don't ever lose sight of the fact that you're going to feel opposed in that. God is calling you. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's giving. Maybe it's, maybe it's tithing and you've never done it before. Maybe it's supporting a ministry. Maybe it's starting a ministry. Whatever it is, let your heart be broken for something. But then be very, very prepared because you're going to face opposition. But we prayed to the Lord, our God, and guarded the city day and night. The metaphor here can't be clear. Guarding hearts day and night to protect ourselves from those who want to attack us. And then Nehemiah goes, as I looked at the situation, I called together the leaders and the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. What does he say? <laughs> Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fights for your friends, your family, and your homes. What Nehemiah was doing is we're building a city, a place we're going to live that we're going to restore what God had started long ago, which was to have his chosen people be here in Jerusalem to be an example to the world. Remember the Lord. Are you facing opposition? Well, step up, step out, and step into God's protection. Be prepared, pray, and then remember. Remember the Lord. I want to pray for you this morning as we, as we end. I retired. I don't know what that means. What I know it offers to me is an opportunity to rethink my whole life. What does God have for me now? Some sand beach in, I don't know, Florida. I wonder if not Florida right now. That's not a good place. Maybe it's get some good beachfront property for inexpensive. But what is it God calling me to? It is not to end. It's a beginning for me. And maybe that's the challenge you need to, what is God preparing you for the next step in your life? Maybe it's, maybe kids are moving out of the house. Maybe, you've, maybe it's the, that time where you can just say, hey, what, what else can God use me for? Here's what I want you to do. Let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. Say, God, what is it I need to, my heart broken. And then pray specifically and then get up and act. I have no authority on you guys. I don't mean that. I, I just go, please, I implore upon you, don't give up. Maybe you're in the middle of a difficulty. Don't give up. But be prepared. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. The reminder of who Nehemiah chose to serve. Yes, he so served a king, but he also served you. You were his king. And he took that comfortable life where everything could have just gone easy, and instead he let his heart be broken. God, I pray for some broken hearts this morning. I pray that there are people here who are saying, Lord, what is it you're calling me to? How can I use how you've gifted me? But then, God, that they would pray and be dependent on you for the power, for the equipping that comes only, only through you. Because that's where miracles happen, God. Bless this group. Bless this day. Amen.